Hello, friends. So in today's session, we are going to talk about informed consent in research studies. And this session will be directed towards two categories of individuals. One, those who are researchers and are designing their research studies themselves and want to draft an informed consent document for this. And second is for ethics committee members who are trying to review an ethical proposal or a research proposal for key ethical aspects in it and are trying to look at the informed consent form. So we will be looking at different aspects of in the informed consent and we will take them one by one. So in this session, we will be talking about four basic principles of medical ethics. We will be talking about the components of informed consent. In the subsequent sessions in this series, we will be talking about the elements of review for an institutional ethics committee and what to do when informed consent is not possible or is not needed. We will also be talking about special situations in informed consent process. So let's begin the first of this session in this, in this series and talk about what are the principles of medical ethics. So there are four cardinal principles of medical ethics. The first is beneficence, obviously. Whatever action you do should be done with the intention to cause benefit to the recipient or the participant. Non-maleficence is the second cardinal principle of medical ethics, which only means primum non nocere or that you should do no harm, that any action that you do in treating a patient or in conducting or carrying out any research, you should not cause any harm to the individual patient. The third important principle of medical ethics is autonomy, which means that the patient has the right to decide what is to be done with him or how he chooses to manage his condition, his disease, whether he decides to participate or not in the research study that you are carrying out. And finally, distributive justice. That means when the resources are limited, then everyone should have an equal share, an equal say on the distribution of resources into those who need it. So which of these four principles do you think informed consent process addresses? Yes? If you identified or if you were thinking of autonomy, then you are perfectly right because it's the individual's autonomy that he decides to participate in a subsequent research process or he wishes to participate in this research. Let me ask you another question. Which do you think best identifies with the informed consent? Is it a process? Is it a form? Is it an audio video recording? Is it a document or a signed document or one with witnesses? You're correct, it's a form, it's an audio video recording, it's a document which is signed in presence of witnesses, but it's just not a form. It's something more than a form. It's an entire process. So informed consent has to be viewed as a process and not as a mere signature on a document. Let's come and, uh, and try and understand what are the components of an informed consent form before we sign the document or when you are designing an informed consent form or when you are reviewing as a part of an ethics committee, then what are the things or what are the components that a good informed consent form or an informed consent document should include. The first important component of an informed consent is the informed part or the information. There has to be information about the study. Some part of this information is mandatory and some part is optional. The second important component of an informed consent process is the voluntariness. That means the individual participant is free to participate or to withdraw from the study. The third important component of an informed consent process is comprehension. That means that the individual participant should have understood what is being told, what is being presented to him, 
as a part of the informed consent process. And the fourth important component of an informed consent process is to document all these three. That means the documentation of the first three is the key component of an informed consent process. Let's take a look at these one by one. So in the information which needs to be presented to the individual includes a statement that the study involves research. The participant should know clearly that he's getting into research and you should explain to him what is the purpose of the research. What is the expected duration? How long the study is going to last? What are the procedures that are going to be followed during this research? Does it have any benefit to the individual or to the community as a whole? Are there any foreseeable risks or discomforts that he's going to face by participating in this research? A statement on confidentiality, which indicates who all will have access to the data or the samples that are going to be drawn from him. Is there any payment or reimbursement for participation? Is there a treatment or compensation which is available in case he gets an injury from the process of participating in this research? And who is the research team? Is there a contact person to whom he can contact? So all these are components which should be there in a research form or the informed consent form. Even if there is no payment or reimbursement as a part of this study protocol, even then it should include a statement that there is no payment in, involved in this research. In addition to the mandatory information that we just talked about, there is some optional information that needs to be a part of an informed consent process. There has to be a declaration of alternate therapies if these are available an idea about any insurance coverage that is available to the participants while they are participating in this study, any possible stigma that they may face from the society by participating in this study. If the researchers have a plan to uh, get monetary benefits out of this research, then what is their plan of sharing this benefit with the participant? How do the researchers intend to publish the photos or the pedigrees if they are collecting these during the part of the research. In addition, if the research study involves the use of any biological material or data, then how do the researchers intend their current and future use? How long are they going to store them? Are they going to store them? And if yes, how long are they going to store them? What is the secondary use that these might be put to? And if there is any sharing of biological materials or data which is going to happen, then how this is going to be affected. The individual participant should have a right to prevent the use of biological sample if he so decides. And there should be provisions to safeguard the confidentiality of the individual in the part of the study. And this should be documented clearly in the informed consent document. In addition to these features, in case the uh, participants are getting into a randomized control trial, then there are some additional information which become important to be a part of the informed consent process and the informed consent document. The participants should be informed of the treatment schedule and the probability that they are going to be randomly assigned to either treatment or to placebo and it is possible that they may get no treatment even though they agree to participate in this RCT. The details of blinding should be presented clearly. Any compensation or treatment if available in case of injury should be clearly highlighted in the informed consent document. Who is the contact person? Who will be contacted if there are queries, if the person wants to know about their rights, or if there is an injury? Is there any anticipated payment? How do they get it? What are the participants' responsibilities on participation in this study? What are the circumstances in which the participant may be terminated or his participation may be terminated without his consent process? Are there any additional costs that may be involved for the participant? The informed consent document should have a statement that the participant will be notified if some new findings develop in case uh, in the course of time, and these may affect his willingness to participate in the study. 
the informed consent process should also involve a discussion on unforeseen risks. So if you're getting into any new therapy, you really don't know what kind of risks may lie ahead in the course of the disease or in the course of treatment. And this should be clearly documented in the informed consent document. What is the number of total subjects that is being included or enrolled for the study? So all this information should be a part of a good informed consent document. The second important component of an informed consent process is what we call voluntariness. That means that the individual participant is free to decide whether he's going to participate in this study or not participate in this study. The informed consent document should include a statement that participation is voluntarily and that it can be withdrawn at any point of time without any penalty and his refusal to participate in the study at a future point will not involve any penalty or discrimination in treatment or uh, uh, any disadvantage in therapy in the current setup. The third important component of an informed consent process is to determine whether the individual participant has understood what is being explained. And there should be a statement in the informed consent document which indicates that the participant has been explained the details and the information in a language that he understands and a statement that he says that he or she has understood clearly what is being told to him. Then this entire process needs to be documented with a signature and to unbiased witnesses. So this, with this we come to an end of part one and I hope you enjoyed this session. In the second part of this series, we will talk about the elements of a review process directed for uh, members of the institutional ethical committees who are trying to review research proposals for ethical concerns. The second part will also include in uh, situations when informed consent is either not possible or it is not needed. Thank you very much for being a part of this presentation and for joining in. I hope to see you again in the second part in this series. Thank you.